We were talking about uh, some new approaches we're using in cucurbit breeding in my lab. Uh, cucurbit crops, um, a, a brief introduction, although many of us are familiar. So uh, uh, cucurbit, short for the members of the cucurbitaceae family, uh, diversity of crops uh, in this plant family. Uh, cucumber, melon, squash, watermelon, uh, a lot of diversity in squash itself. There are uh, three different species that we refer to collectively, pumpkins or squash. Uh, these are all crops with small genomes. They are diploid, although cucurbita is a uh, recovering uh, tetraploid, uh, 40 chromosomes. It has sequenced genomes that uh, are coming together except people in Machado that are still works in process for the assembly. So as we look at these crops, some of the new ways forward that my lab has been employing is breeding for flavor uh, and quality. And even as we work within that, moving from pedigree selection to genomic selection, and it's really working for us well uh, for uh, uh, fruit quality in butternut squash. Uh, and using selection as a selection tool. Uh, so uh, lethal pathogens uh, that just give us the, the fittest uh, to continue on the next generation. And also in all this, an opportunity to, uh, as Jeff mentioned, have some influence on cuisine. Uh, as we look forward to what are the best ways to be able to have uh, sustainable uh, crops that really address climate change, reduce waste, uh, not, pairing the work we can do on the breeding end with uh, work we can do in changing some of the, the targets we have available to us. Okay. Um, and the honey nut squash, uh, Jeff uh, introduced well, was kind of our first uh, example of this where we really started to change uh, the palette for what can be in the marketplace for squash. A uh, great partnership with the chef Dan Barber where we really w work to concentrate flavors uh, and actually get a new type of squash, a mini butternut, out in the marketplace and really accepted uh, and is now flourishing. But as in breeding, so this work is uh, not done, uh, and so it's, we've looked to see what can we further do to improve honey nut. And looking at uh, the pedigree of honey nut, it's a complex one, we've just abbreviated here. Uh, a lot of what's really great in honey nut for quality is because it has an interspecific cross in its background that took a lot of the starch and other great qualities of a buttercup squash uh, introduced into a butternut squash background. Dick Robinson started this work in the 80s, Molly John continued it, and we ended up finally with a honey nut squash that retains, gets a lot of a quality boost from presumably introgressions from that buttercup parent. Still though, honey nut, it could, it's a great squash, but it could store longer, it could use some powdery mildew resistance. Luckily, there's another uh, squash bugle that's already in the program. It's a peer line, a great way to start a breeding program. In the typical program, the pedigree breeding program is pretty straightforward, crossing uh, the parents we select, doing a lot of selection within an F2, and continuing to trial and select, uh, purify things until we get them to the market at about an F8 stage. And working within this cross between honey nut and bugle, we've been really successful. Uh, several new improved cultivars uh, that are starting to come out onto the market. Uh, we have a panel of mini butternuts where we've taken all the goodness of honey nut and added in the powdery mildew resistance of bugle. And not only have we uh, combine those characteristics. One of the challenges with honey nut is it's not a long storing squash. There's a, a issue it'll have where it'll dry out in storage. Hollow neck is the disorder. Uh, and some of our newer selections are generation two. Uh, they will store really well without drying out well into February and beyond. Okay. So not only have we worked within this mini butternut category, Working with Honey Nut, we have also explored what happens when we combine it with different pumpkins from different hemispheres. And so as we take our Honey Nut squash, which is kind of the epitome of a really sweet, creamy squash, and combine it with the best squash you find in tempura in Japan, we've found we've got some great new cultivars coming on the market that combine the best of both with excellent storage. Uh, Honey nut is a longer season squash. Doing some interspecific crosses again uh, with some Maxima squash. In these crosses, we can improve the uh, insect resistance of the Maxima parent, and we can also reduce the time to maturity by over three weeks. And so some dramatic gains that can be made there where honey nut is key in maintaining 
the quality of the Kabocha parent. And also uh, some of the artistic side as we can kind of get into our, our blue period here. Uh, so with all of these uh, different squash and the pedigree uh, pr uh, approach in general, we've been really successful. Uh, so far since I've been in the faculty, faculty here, we have 30 commercial licenses on products from this approach. Uh, but still there's reason to try to look beyond, see what more we can do. Um, and some of the challenges are um, the hand pollinations biases the phenotype. If you're getting a self-pollination, trying to get the flowers to nick, uh, often you get some, op some open pollinated fruit you need to rip off, and you're distorting yield while you're trying to look at some other uh, characteristics and to be able to get seed for the next generation. Uh, it's a large crop uh, in the greenhouse, you trellis them up, the fruit hang from the rafters. Uh, we can't really select this generation. Um, and also in this pedigree approach, most of the gain is limited to just those initial generations. So really needing a way to be able to change uh, some of the input costs in this. Um, and so that's why we started to move toward genomic selection. Uh, many people are uh, starting to uh, explore this approach more and more. For us, uh, we approached it for that different set of reasons to really look at all the input costs in the breeding process and really just be able to advance the best plants in the field. So since we already knew there was a very uh, fertile cross between honey nut and bugle and we were able to get some great cultivars out of it already, uh, we went back to this uh, uh, population, intermated the F2, put a training uh, generation out in the field, and then started cycles of genomic selection from there where we're putting out uh, 10 progeny from 20 plants, uh, using genomic selection to pick the top 20, intermating them, and then that is, uh, our, has been our approach. Uh, in the process, we had to develop a capacity to take a lot more samples uh, into the lab. Uh, this is uh, just Chris Hernandez's plot, uh, one of several we have, uh, but this alone, uh, he will have about five cubic yards of squash coming in, and to be able to do all those quality assessments, we had to be able to tool up in our approaches. And so we've uh, developed a system, uh, one of the uh, prime innovations, but the least technology is a squash guillotine here. Uh, but so as we have 1,200 squash coming in, need them all cut, uh, just have a pipeline so we can efficiently take digital data from there, uh, we, where we have the color data, dimensional data, weight, uh, and then we can continue there and barcodes that will print out on the fly so we can be able to send many different samples uh, from each squash for many different analyses. Okay. And uh, the great thing about uh, the genomic selection approach is it's working for us, right? Uh, and so using some, uh, here's the phenotypic uh, correlations between the traits we care most about for squash quality. Uh, so bricks is correlates to the sweetness of the squash. The dry matter is the smooth texture, a good mouthfeel. And the A star is a color space value that looks at the orange redness of the squash. And for us, we find that all of these traits are either positively correlated or either somewhat positively or at least neutrally correlated. There's none of these that are in opposition. And so this allows the ready use of a multi-trait model uh, that is actually mirroring the phenotypic selection we were doing in the program already. And to look at some of uh, the outputs of the work so far, uh, next year we'll be actually growing out the genomically selected squash next to uh, the neutral population and the phenotypically selected squash so we can see the gains we've made. In the meantime, see, we're getting some good uh, cross-validation accuracies for the three traits we care the most about. The genetic correlations uh, are really close to matching the phenotypic correlations. Uh, so here again on the previous slide between bricks and dry matter is really strong. The other two are a little weaker. Um, the genetic correlations are you know, mirroring that. Looking at the heritability of some of the traits, uh, they're also uh, looking good. Uh, particularly, we're able to select for the A star color space value, so that orange redness. Uh, and looking at the uh, genomic architecture of that, it kind of makes sense that we're uh, getting such a good heritability. It looks like the genetic architecture of that is quite straightforward. So that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> to explore 
that uh, the redness, the color content a little bit more, uh, uh, working with uh, Lee Lee, uh, the Holly Center, we can start to look at, so what is the actual carotenoid composition of a honey nut squash? It's more orange, should have more carotenoids. So breaking it down, the one parent we use in a lot of the cross is Bugle, here's the internal standard, has quite a bit of beta carotene and lutein. And looking at the carotenoid biosynthetic pathway, it branches off from lycopene to beta carotene, lutein. In buttercup squash, which is one of the parents that was originally used to create honey nut, you see there's a new peak with quite a lot of this other compound, flavoxanthin. It's actually a further hydroxylated metabolite of lutein. In honey nut, so not only can you see it's clearly much more orange, uh, it has about twice the amount of beta carotene as a typical butternut squash, about four times the amount of lutein, and additionally another carotenoid alpha carotene uh, that's an intermediate between uh, lycopene and lutein that's also contributing substantially to the carotenoid content. And as we start to now be able to put this into some of the phenotyping uh, we're doing for the genomic selection, um, we also have the opportunity and have been taking RNA-seq data using the quant-seq approach. We have just recently published with uh, my student Lindsay a good comparative uh, gene expression uh, approach looking through the metabolism for carotenoid, starch, and sucrose metabolism. And in this case, the study was looking at, so what's the variation we see intraspecifically between the subspecies of cucurbita people? Now as we're starting to get the honey nut data in in these populations, it's, we can also ask the question of, so as we have introgressions from maxima into butternut, this forms the basis for the hypotheses about what are the expression differences we should be seeing uh, interspecifically between maxima and moshada, and do they mirror what we saw within cucurbita people? The other uh, thing that has been uh, a great feature of Honey Nut and what's been sort of the key to some of the consumer uh, experience is typically in a butternut squash, it's very hard to tell the difference between one that is really ripe and one that is somewhat ripe. And so here are two, uh, and without the juxtaposition, it'd be hard to tell which one is the ripe one. Um, most of the squash in the grocery store, uh, same goes. For Honey Nut, uh, part of, partly due to its buttercup heritage, it has this, what I recall, uh, built-in ripeness indicator. Uh, you'll see it's going from a dark green, which consumers are used to uh, being able to associate with an unripe banana, an unripe tomato. Uh, squash really didn't have a ripeness indicator before. So as honey nut ripens from dark green to orange, it's a way for, to have a consistent consumer experience and for people to be able to select the best produce. Uh, looking at the genetic architecture of this, also within our genomic selection program, uh, also has a rather simple architecture. And it's just been really great for us to be able to take some uh, relationships that we are very interested in and we have the breeding population, the genomic selection, having them talk to each other. So we're actually getting some, uh, as we're doing the genotyping, to be able to get uh, some information about some of the underlying genetics at the same time. And the other uh, thing we're really proud of that's resulted from that is kind of the culmination of this where we have a squash that is, you know, sweeter, creamier, uh, richer uh, carotenoid content, identifiable. Uh, you can tell when it's ripe, so you always get the great consumer. Um, you know, you're getting a squash that you, you know you're going to like when you buy it. Uh, and so one of the great things is to be able to start to see Honey Nut labeled and sold by name in stores. Uh, and so this is kind of a, um, usually something that's reserved, we do this, with, we see those apples, potato varieties. And so for us, uh, coming at it from squash, it's really great for us to be able to start to see people that are able to seek something out by cultivar name. Okay. So, Beyond you know, the work just to create this is a really delicious produce, really nutritious produce, we also need to make sure our work is grounded in grower needs. Um, <clears throat> one project uh, I've been involved in is really looking across the whole northern U.S. at the unique needs we have in our northern uh, growing environment. So NOVIC, the Northern Vegetable Inc Improvement Collaborative, is working on breeding, evaluating an array of crops for their performance in the northern U.S. Last year, we uh, 
and worked on a project to actually focus on the Northeast and to be able to come up with some recommendations and really survey the needs of our growers specifically to the Northeast. Uh, about a decade ago uh, was the last time this was done. Uh, Molly John led the efforts with then with the Organic Seed Partnership, the Public Seed Initiative, to really get our growers the crops they need and with an understanding that often the seeds that are adapted for California, Florida production environments really are not going to have the same traits that we need here. So uh, Rachel in my group uh, led this effort. Uh, over a thousand uh, growers were contacted. We had 210 responses back. And the results of the survey was analyzed by a, a working group here uh, that were able to interpret those responses and come out with some action items from that. So in terms of the crops the growers prioritized uh, that we work on, uh, some of the looking at the certified organic growers and growers using uh, uh, non-certified practices, but otherwise organic. Um, you see tomato, winter squash, potato were the top three that were the crops where people want to see the most investment in new variety development. And in terms of the challenges, so we're kind of looking at the responses. Late blight, downy mildew were the primary pathogens that were still a challenge for many growers. Uh, flea beetles, uh, cucumber beetles, Colorado potato beetles were the primary insect path, uh, uh, challenges for these growers. And so emerging from this, we get a good idea of the crops that are still have needs to be met and really where some of those needs are. So two of the major uh, uh, foci for us on pest and disease resistance do happen to be downy mildew resistance and striped cucumber beetle resistance in, in line with the grow responses. Downy mildew, uh, uh, Bill Holdsworth told you about some of this work a couple months ago if you saw his seminar. Downy mildew was held in check with some genetic controls for decades. It was about a decade ago when we started to see the pathogen population change. Cultivars that had been resistant to downy mildew were suddenly just being destroyed by them. Uh, and so from a, a couple of years ago, uh, this is one of our field trials uh, by Janine Davis and Lu Ping uh, down in Waynesville, North Carolina. You can see the first symptoms of the pathogen start to appear at the end of July. Um, by August 7th, the entire crop is wiped out. Um, it's been a problem throughout the U.S. It can overwinter in Florida, move up the East Coast in tropical storms as uh, cucurbits are grown, and has the ability to overwinter in Michigan. So between North Carolina and Michigan, two of the prime pickle growing areas are being affected. Um, so all the resistance is breaking down, and further we're starting to see the breakdown of efficacy of fungicides against the pathogen. You can see the destructiveness of it. So this was tremendous priority. So as we approach this, we also want to do this differently. So similarly to how we use genomic selection to be able to integrate a recurrent selection uh, capacity uh, in our breeding work and change up from the pedigree approach. Uh, to be able to work with large populations to stay ahead of a dynamic evolving pathogen and to also change our approaches for cucumber. So rather than the traditional approach pollinating every plant, we are putting out large populations between sources of moderate resistance, the best we could find at the time, out in the field. And so here, uh, Lauren is independently managing thousands of uh, cucumber plants. And as downy mildew moves into the field, and we start to go through and find the best plants for resistance, um, this is where I mentioned we'd look at using just the pathogen to do the selection. And throughout the whole field, we're able to start to identify the plants that have the best combinations of resistance, uh, take cuttings from those into the greenhouse, root them it's quite easily, uh, just in some wet potting soil, and they root well. Uh, and then the uh, stars for resistance that also have a decent fruit yield uh, get potted up and we're able to do recurrent selection within that. So we're able to control the pollen parent and make really good progress against the pathogen that's, that's also evolving uh, sexually. And so the breakthrough, uh, two of our cultivars, uh, this first one, 264, that was uh, developed by Bill Holdsworth and 401 that Lauren Brzezowski developed in my lab, looking at the, the accumulated disease, so the area under the disease progress curve, 
the least, these are the two least diseased uh, cucumbers in our trials last year and have been for a number of years. Um, some of our other breeding lines and otherwise the susceptible control and other material that would be available um, that is claiming some downy mildew resistance. So ours very much the least diseased in the trial. Also, uh, depending when you plant it, and so as downy mildew moves around, is airily dispersed, we can track it, see when it's going to enter an area. Also, historically, there's different times when it does show up. There's a lot of cucumbers that are wonderful and you can plant at the times of year when you don't have downy mildew around. The key is knowing when downy mildew arrives, and if you're going to want to get a yield of cucumbers at that time, uh, well, here are some of the the yield trial data when we're planting in August in this area when downy mildew is in full force. And so the, the newer release, DMR 401, we're getting many harvested fruit per plant in both organic and conventional trials. The earliness is competitive with some of the best commonly used material. Dasher is one of the most widely grown cucumbers. So we are uh, having about the same earliness and also when downy mildew is around, this is the crop that yields. Um, beyond just some of the data, uh, the actual phenotypes in the, of the plants in the field is striking. Uh, so our two most resistant lines um, and you know, the other alternatives you might have. And even down uh, North Carolina, again, Janine Davis's uh, trials. Looking through this field, it's just a great feeling to be able to see there, these promising uh, plots where you see a green, lush plant still producing uh, and knowing we've been able to deliver a slicing cucumber that's going to work for these growers uh, up and down the East Coast, uh, into Michigan, and all the trials is doing well. And this is also going to be the start of transferring resistance into pickling cucumbers for uh, the pickle growers as well. The other challenge uh, that's a big challenge for us, especially organic systems, uh, striped cucumber beetles this past season, especially, um, they had a mild winter. Uh, there were a lot of striped cucumber beetles around. Um, again, we got a lot of calls from growers, gardeners that were seeing for the first time these truly massive waves of cucumber beetles. Uh, and for an organic grower, some of the control options you would have, there are some chemicals with some efficacy. Uh, row cover is a popular approach. Can, for conventional growers, they've been relying on neonicotinoid insecticides for a long time. Um, they've been very effective about the cucumber beetles, but increasingly there's more concern about the impacts, the secondary impacts on pollinators and pollinator health. You can see the, the flower that you would you know, need a bee to visit to pollinate the crop is also one of the primaries that cucumber beetles are attracted to, so getting specific control has been a bit um, increasingly under scrutiny. And so our approach, uh, we have a, we're doing a lot of field assays, looking at beetle damage. There are some you know, striking differences in plant performance, how much uh, beetle-based defoliation they experience. <clears throat> and some of the extremes are, uh, again, quite striking, where you have one plant that is virtually untouched by the beetles and another plant that is almost eaten away, and the, some of the plants that survive are succumbing to bacterial wilt that's vectored also by the cucumber beetles. So as we work through um, these different uh, field assays and complementary greenhouse assays to be able to look to see where can we find uh, some resistance or non-preference to the cucumber beetles, we started to go through and it was initially a cultivar based approach where often that's been the approach to be able to look at, so what are the recommendations you can give to a grower in what they can grow? Uh, and so taking out the popular cultivars and looking through that. As we started to further look at the different uh, squash by market class, we can see a pattern starting to emerge where this gradation of increasing uh, cucumber beetle defoliation. And it becomes even well, much more interesting once you break this down further and uh, separate it out by subspecies. And the, the driver behind this is there's two subspecies in squash uh, and cucurbita pipo. Uh, one, the subspecies Texana, um, which has the summer squash, delicata, acorn, patty pan squash. This arose through a separate domestication event than cucurbita people, subspecies people that has zucchini and pumpkin. 
And so this has been a very compelling question for us now is, so what are the differences, and that's not between these different cultures that have been looked at, but between subspecies, domestication, what different characteristics uh, were captured in those events? Um, and so the approach, and again, using selection to select, uh, this is one of uh, Lauren's uh, phenotyping cages here where we're going out into the field collecting thousands of uh, cucumber beetles, uh, unleashing them on all the seedlings inside the cage, and looking for plants where we can find a clear difference. So here's one that is strongly preferred by beetles. The one that's re been reduced to lace here is also strongly preferred. But we do find ones where they just leave them untouched. And so there is real promise to be able to breed for this and just using the beetles to do the selection, the survivors get potted up. Um, it is still an underpowered analysis, but looking at uh, the non-preference uh, by cucumber beetles, there's at least one uh, promising uh, locus right now looking at a, a, a GWAS of some of these populations. And so our hypotheses and so how we're starting to approach this uh, is we have two different subspecies where we see the preference contrast. I'm starting to look at uh, golden zucchini, which is here, which is the most highly preferred we found. Starting to look at, you know, is there a constitutive metabolite that's attractive? Is it a nutritional compound? Is it a volatile that's attracting the cucumber beetles in? Um, an alternate hypothesis looking at the non-preferred uh, summer squash. Um, is there a constitutive or induced metabolite that's either anti-nutritive or a volatile that is uh, causing the beetles to feed less on this plant? Uh, also, you know, could it be an induced defense? So looking at this, we're starting to look at the headspace volatiles of these plants with and without beetle damage. There are some compelling hits. Also looking at uh, RNA-seq of the different pathways that are affected by this. We're seeing a lot of also very cool hits in some insect uh, defense pathways that have been characterized before. Uh, now it's just a matter of taking some of those previous analyses, getting some more power, and deploying those techniques on some populations that we'll have a chance to look at this summer. And so in those two examples, looking at the striped cucumber beetles, downy mildew, we're able to be able to take advantage of a pasture pathogen to be able to move into a breeding population, do the selection for us. We're really taking the survivors and bringing them forward. What we're starting to be able to look at with some of the genomic tools we now have in cucurbits is the ability to see, so what are those loci under selection? Um, a case study uh, to show you uh, why we're going the direction we are in those is looking at powdery mildew resistance. So powdery mildew resistance uh, was worked on uh, starting in the 80s. Uh, Henry Munger uh, and his students uh, started to move powdery mildew resistance from this wild gourd cucurbita okeechobeeensis into cultivated squash through a series of interspecific crosses. They first moved the resistance into butternut squash, and then from there they were able to move butter, uh, the resistance into cucurbit peepo, zucchinis, jack-o'-lanterns, all of the powdery mildew resistant cucurbit peepo we know about in the world uh, are the result of this kind of two-step transfer between species of a resistance locus. Otherwise, looking within cucurbit peepo, there's no native resistance available. So what occurred to us is the, the process this undertook, so taking the wild gourd, the two interspecific transfers, that was a pretty strong filter. So the, for the resistance locus, you know, that was the uh, one region of the genome that was transferred. And this was such a breakthrough and continues to be a critically important trait, the only source of resistance against the pathogen that affects all cucurbit growers. This was a, a, a trait and the germplasm from this was shared across the world. And so we now have uh, one uh, gene that dozens of plant breeding companies are working with, hundreds of plant breeders, and millions of millions of plants. And so what they ended up in the process creating is a tremendous resource where the only thing all of those should share in common is actually the resistance locus itself. And all the rest of the genome has been uh, kind of their elite parents. 
So looking across the 20 chromosomes uh, in cucurbita, uh, and we're shading the regions blue where we find SNPs that are present in the wild resistance source relative to the susceptible gray for cucurbita people. See, this first step, there is a few regions or a larger region that is transferred as we have our two powdery mildew resistant plants on the top in, and the resistance coated in red compared to a susceptible butternut which lacks any of these introgressions. As we move into the Cornell developed lines in cucurbita pepo, the introgression gets smaller and see the whole rest of the genome does not contain any uh, of the wild species. Uh, and we just continue to get a smaller and smaller region that's introgressed. Uh, so here it is blown up. And so we end up with is a region right here where we find the resistance. A recombination event has made this line susceptible. So we've gone from you know, the whole genome, a about 500 KB region down to a seven, uh, well this is in the end about a 500 KB region where we know the resistance is. And further, as we uh, started to look at all the cultivars that have been developed uh, and that have incorporated this resistance, uh, we are able to just narrow the, re the interval with the resistance gene down from 500 KB to 75 KB, essentially a deletion mapping approach. And now we just have a small region of the genome that has uh, several uh, you know, very compelling candidate genes that have been implicated in disease resistance in other species. And this has been the history in much of the back cross breeding Henry Munger champion that a lot of vegetable uh, improvement has been based on. Uh, and we're going to continue uh, to use this approach. We've found this approach very effective already. We've, and both in powdery mildew here in squash and in pepper, uh, we also are able to use this approach of just uh, taking resistant cultivars, genotyping and finding where's the regions from the resistant donor. Okay. And the other benefit of being able to bring in all this material from all over the world uh, where people have been breeding in many different backgrounds is the resource exists already. And so it's just a matter of genotyping what's already been created by breeders. Uh, as we can do a common analysis here at Cornell, the tools we generate, and so one marker that here is a CAPS marker for powdery mildew resistance and is of course compatible on all the other platforms, is we're also generating uh, results, molecular markers that are useful across basically all the breeding backgrounds that are in use. And so it's taking a resource that exists, one genotyping pass confirming the phenotypes, and now we have a tool that we know can be deployed in virtually all backgrounds and used by cucurbit breeders, uh, squash breeders across the globe. And we're also using this approach as part of a cucurbit cap project. We're very glad uh, to be part of now uh, where this is the same story for virus resistance. And so just really looking to see, so where do you see the wild species DNA out there? If the you know, same introgression in all the wild species, from the wild species is in all the recent varieties, well, there's your region. And so in this, you know, we've had some really great success in being able to move forward, uh, downy mildew, the work in powdery mildew quality. Um, one of the questions that we have to ask, and uh, plant breeders were increasingly uh, requested to consider is, so the progress we make, how long will it last? Uh, so how will climate change really impact this? Uh, and Looking at some of the crosses where we're starting to see great potential uh, in here in Lauren's work, as we can have a yellow summer squash here that the striped cucumber beetles I was talking about will leave alone, the plant's so healthy. We've put out, Lauren's put out quarter acre plots of this and the beetles have largely left it alone. They've attacked a couple plants, whereas this of course they'll eat to the ground. So as we're looking at the difference between so we're, here we're breeding for market a bit because a yellow summer squash is in general higher yielding. Uh, it is not preferred by the beetles, uh, but still there's a market for the zucchini types and so that's why we're transferring this non-preference into a zucchini background. But even as we're successful and it's looking increasingly like it's a very effective approach, many of my projects now have a collaborator in the southeast. And in the southeast, we can ask, okay, so as climate change happens, as we get milder winters, the cucumber beetles took off, devastated everything. Uh, in many of our plots this past year, um, 
milder winters, what can they tell us about what we should be breeding for, what, what should we be preparing for? And unfortunately for zucchini, for cucurbit, cucurbit pipo, talking to the growers, many have given up growing zucchinis, uh, summer squash altogether, and it has been because of another pest, a vine borer, uh, that moves in, will tunnel through the plant, and cause a wilt decline of the plant. And so even as we're now able to uh, be able to get some resistance, non-preference to the cucumber beetle, there's other challenges we know are coming. Okay. And for us, uh, one of the greatest allies in this and looking to see, so what can we do about this, has been a fantastic collaboration I've had with Chef Dan Barber. Uh, he was instrumental in being able to take a miniature butternut squash that tasted great, uh, was a much more convenient size, uh, great quality, but actually introduced a new market class uh, to the world. And, and through his restaurant, through his creativity, being able to really share pe with people that this is delicious uh, and was key in being able to introduce that and really helping us get it popularized. So this is a project where we found ourselves kind of meeting at the middle because there is another summer squash in the butternut species, a cucurbit moschata. It's an Italian type, this tromboncino type summer squash um, that is naturally resistant to vine borers because here we have a zucchini stem where you see the, the hollow part in the middle that the vine borers can easily tunnel into and that's how they make their way through the plant. A moschata stem, this tromboncino, it's solid. It's much more resistant. The beetles, the vine borers, don't really colonize these plants. Dan was interested in it because it tastes better. Uh, and so working together, doing tastes, figuring out what stages to harvest, uh, what are some of the different diversity we have to sample within squash, uh, as he was looking to see how can we guide the flavor and the functionality in the kitchen, and I could see where could we meet that in the genetics. We have some very exciting projects now where we're able to help popularize Trembancino, uh, which is going to be a great benefit to the growers in the southeast, where as they moved away from the cucurbit people cultivars, often they'd say, but we can grow Trembancino, but kind of what of the market for it? Well, uh, uh, pr uh, picked at the right stage, prepared in a way, it is really delicious and much more flavor than zucchini and is really the sustainable choice that we want to focus on. And looking at the cucumber work, whenever uh, we find a source of resistance, it's usually in a wild species where we need to then bring that resistance across into one of our common market types. Uh, and increasingly for downy mildew resistance, we are looking uh, in China and finding Chinese cucumbers as the foundation of much of the market, more cucumber breeding, was these Chinese cucumbers where we brought key characteristics into a slicing type. Uh, we're looking in India, you find a lot of resistance uh, where the Pune Kira cucumber, you know, so the cucumber of Pune, India, um, is where we find the resistance and we bring that across uh, through many years, lots of work, a lot of resources to be able to bring these resistances into a specific market class. Um, our first uh, cucumbers that were downy mildew resistance had a white skin. Uh, they taste great. Uh, there's a whole new flavor profile you access in those different cucumbers, but it's kind of getting people to try them, getting people to re recognize the great flavors there. And so especially thinking about a cucumber in India, a cucumber in China, if it's the common cucumber in those cultures, well, you know, there's already uh, quite a bit to be said for its culinary, culinary merits. And so it's how can we help popularize, introduce these into American cuisine because we have much more immediate access to much more sustainable disease resistant cultivars. And uh, as we've explored further, getting into looking at some of the waste in the food system, uh, Getting, as we get different cucurbits that are much more disease resistant, we're getting them producing well up into the frost uh, in the Northeast. And so here is a, a cucurbit plot I maintain where you can see on the right are 
the typical reaction where you have some uh, delicious crops, but ones that are susceptible or don't have a really high level of resistance to different foliar diseases, mildews, uh, and on the left, um, very vigorously growing plants. The lump there is uh, what is uh, the vines going up and over my transplanter as I didn't keep them chopped back. And so here, as we get some crops that have very lush, vigorous growth, is looking to see, well, what are the other opportunities to use some of the food that's growing here? Uh, many cultures around the world already know this. Uh, cucurbits were uh, first domesticated uh, for you know, the edible parts of their foliage and seeds. Fruit came on much later in our use of them culinarily. And so one of the fun collaborations has been going through, in addition to selecting for delicious fruit, uh, a vigorous vine, something that's going to be productive for the grower, is actually an opportunity to select for delicious vines in the crop. There is a ton of food right here that's going to be lost to the frost. And so here's a cucurbita a peepo pedial penne pasta that is delicious. Uh, and so this is an inspiration of Chef Dan Barber and a collaboration between us to together look at some of these crops and the change we can make and try to come up with uh, the next new crops that are going to succeed for everybody. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, an awesome group of graduate students and postdoc that have tr contributed tremendously, uh, done much of many of the projects I shared, uh, a great uh, team, uh, Marianne, Emily, Sarah, of course, Dan Barber, uh, Lee, and Chris. Uh, uh, Lee is uh, our collaborator in much of the nutrition work. Chris Smart, I didn't get a chance to show all the fun things we're doing for phytophthora resistance. Uh, much of a legacy from Henry Munger, Molly John, some large grant teams that are helping to drive much of this, and of course, our sponsors, NEPA, Seed Matters, uh, Sustainability Foundation, and the David Rockefeller Fund. Thank you. <laughs>